Hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art. Uh, we're located in Gloucester, uh, Massachusetts. And this is this, uh, another video we're doing uh, uh, on 19th and early 20th century, through, sort of through the end of the Qing Dynasty uh, on uh, Chinese porcelain. And I thought this video would be interesting. We're going to talk about Famille Vert. Uh, which was a, a term that was coined by French Jesuits that were living in China when they wrote letters home. That's why you hear terms like uh, famille vert, famille rose, famille jaune, and all that. This one's about famille vert. It's an interesting thing. Uh, during the 19th century, a great number of porcelains were made using this palette. It was begun, uh, or came into huge popularity during the Kangxi period. And as you can see with this piece right here, this is a 19th century Kangxi style mallet base. It's got a beautiful iron red ground and uh, particularly well painted. It's the kind of vase that uh, dealers often try to sell as a, a period one. It isn't. This is a 19th century uh, uh, rendition. It's beautifully painted though with good enamels, nice white porcelain. Uh, the outlines of the flowers and the leaves and the, uh, the way the birds are executed are really quite good. But you just need to turn it over and take a look at that foot if you're not sure. And that's a foot you see only on 19th century porcelains. It's nicely done, has the double blue ring, but it's a later copy. So bear that in mind. This is another 19th century Kangxi style Meiping vase. Uh, also using the palette, also very well painted and very attractive. The, they were able to do these in considerable numbers. And... Uh, uh, this is a, a lovely one. It's a story of a, a scholar having a dream at his desk. You can see the scrolly dream bubble coming out of his head. And he's thinking about this uh, uh, her, sort of a heroic scene with a soldier coming along and um, some people. You notice there's a little flaking in the enamels. That is a problem with some of these 19th century porcelains. And as with all uh, copies of Kangxi uh, pieces, you can if you're not sure by looking at the body, you can just turn it over and you look at the bottom. And that is not a Kangxi foot. That's not the foot you want to see. It's a little too crude. It's not white enough. It's not the right shape. Um, yes, it's marked. The marks mean nothing on these. Trust me. And here's another. This is a baluster vase done during the first half of the 19th century in the sort of in the Kangxi style also. Again, with the often with that iron red and the green. The decoration is excellent on this, but like all of them, the bottom, the foot just doesn't uh, meet muster, and uh, the rest of the piece isn't right as well, but the foot is a big indicator if you're not certain. All right, now we move into this. Another Famille Vert example. This is interesting. It's sort of a pastiche of some um, later uh, uh, designs, Kangxi uh, to Qinlung uh, period, the, the flower basket and so forth is more commonly seen in Chin Lung pieces, um, but it's beautifully done. The details of this are quite excellent, and this is a rather late piece. This is just, you know well into the well into the 19th century, but the, they were able to do these quite skillfully. Uh, they lack some of the uh, the fluidity of the period ones, and here again, here you have another type of foot you're going to see. This is a later uh, base that you see, uh, you know, after 1870. And it's sort of a squared foot with a blue ring. And here's a very attractive Femi Ver uh, vase. Beautifully done. Uh, it's a little too stiff to be period, and the shape is a little bit off. But it's a lovely example. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's worth owning. It's a nice thing. But don't pay a Kangxi price for it. All right. This vase we had a number of years ago. It was over 34 inches tall. This was a massive vase, Yen Yen vase. It is a copy, but it's a very well done one. Uh, the green is a little too green, but the uh, decoration on this was quite outstanding. And here is another, uh, sort of another Femi Noir uh, with Ver decoration, uh, late 18th century, with the uh, bird on branch over the rocky outcropping and uh, apple blossoms. Very well painted, and the artist did a fairly good job of putting in the aubergine and grading the greens and. Uh, doing the little details on the rocks, but it is clearly a uh, late 19th century example, um, even with the uh, sort of dry toning of the of the black enamel. The foot underneath, like the previous one, is a later 19th century foot. 
it's a little bit too uh, uh, finished. It's not nearly white enough. And uh, the mark is uh, not particularly well drawn, but it's competently drawn. We can say that. All right. The next example is really not a familial ver piece, but it could just as well have been if they just put some green on it. It's a Femi Noir vase, and it has soft pinks and uh, uh, tan colors in it, and it was done during the uh, uh, latter part of the uh, uh, 19th century. It's very attractive. It was, uh, we sold it to a lady in England. It had been made into a lamp, but it was probably produced around the, well, 1850, middle of the, uh, of the 19th century judging by the look of that foot on there. And uh, it has a slight greenish tone. So we're going to get away with calling this ver for, for the sake of argument here. It's really not, though. And here we have a pair of Femi Ver Foo lions made during the 19th century. Very typical, green, nice expressions on their faces. The father with the, with the, uh, the ball and the mother uh, with the baby uh, 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 Foo climbing up upper. And here's the underside. Uh, that's about how a lot of them look. This one's particularly dirty, but uh, sort of rustic and unglazed and hollowed out up in there and uh, so forth. Here's a uh, Kangxi style little uh, uh, biscuit glazed uh, piece with uh, flowers and uh, winged dragons. It's a small vase. This is only about five or six inches tall, but very nice quality and well done. Uh, slightly stiff, and, uh, but it's, it's a, a good attempt. Here's the underside of it. It's flat, recessed, no glaze, a little dirty, minor imperfections, but very attractive, nice, nice thing. If you find one out there and you like it, buy it. And here's a here's one that, that we we weren't we weren't quite sure where to put this. This is a flambe glazed uh, Lang Yao uh, uh, piece with uh, green enamels over the over it with a dragon. It's sort of an interesting vase, very unusual with that big white-lipped rim on it, and a uh, nice, nice form, though, and, and well-decorated, beautifully decorated um, with all those greens. And when you flip it over, uh, like a lot of Lang Yao pieces, the bases are often white and have a crackle to them like this. Uh, a few people that saw this thought maybe it was 18th century. I, don't, I didn't think it was. I thought it was early 19th, but uh, regardless, uh, it's a nice, a nice example and uh, um, very attractive. And you can't really talk about Femiver without talking about Femiver screens and plaques. They did lots of them, and they were typically landscapes like this. And there was a definite style to how they painted the rocks, the sort of rolling, scrolling rock formations, cre you know, coming up in layers out of the ground, and lots of figures in these all the time. They often have a lot of figures, a lot of activity. There's much to look at. And often they're linked by little bridges and islands with, with huts and buildings and fishermen. Uh, this one, there's a man riding a mule, and uh, some very nicely done pine trees in the foreground, sort of covering this small building with a cupola on top of it. And here's another example. This is actually from the same set. Again, you have that same pattern of the, of the, of the wavy uh, rocks creeping out in the, in, towards the water. And there's a banner on the dock, and there's some uh, men in the foreground by one of the buildings and uh, this, this, the rocky formations in the background. Here's a detail of it. A lot of detail, a lot of detail in these. They, they worked very hard on these. The, the people that painted tiles were really, really uh, painting as though they were painting on scrolls. Uh, l uh, lots of uh, nice imagery in there. Very three-dimensional, which is, can be sometimes unusual in some Chinese art. Chinese art can often look rather flat, but not this. And uh, here are the figures uh, standing on a wash green ground, uh, looking out on the water. And there's a building with the, uh, again, a cupola at the top. And then you have these, these sort of minimalist uh, late 19th century uh, screens, or uh, plaques rather. And you have that nice sort of very, very well done mist effect creeping around the bases of the mountains with the little boat in the foreground. You know, the, the scene almost looks like a Japanese scene, but it's not. It is Chinese. And this is a fabulous uh, screen or tile uh, that we had. It was a table screen. It was quite large. It was over 30 inches, 28 inches tall or something like that. But beautiful detail throughout. And they painted a frame on it. Instead of having a frame or having a border, they actually painted the frame uh, onto the piece. And here are these black birds 
I mention these all the time. Toward the end of the 19th century, you, you, you seem to come across more and more and more black birds appearing in paintings. They became a, uh, sort of a stylized thing. So they're either in flight or perched, as they are here. And here's a very good shot. Uh, give you a look at the upper corner of the frame. And uh, as you always want to do, is you want to look at how the leaves are all done very delicately, outlined in black and then washed in. And the fungus and the mold growing on the tree, those little dots, the way they creep off. Quite attractive. And here's the back of one of these. The backs of tiles from the 18th to the 19th century really didn't change much. They all have this same sort of vertical lineage on them. Um, uh, it, was, it was how they were made. And uh, people often, I've said this also before, a lot of people think that because they have that appearance, those the vertical lines, they have to be much older than they are. And they're not. They they continue to make them to this very day in the same manner. All right. Here we have a rather nice uh, Tung Shi period um, uh, teapot with a bird over perched over a spotted deer. Uh, has a mark on the bottom. It's well done. And uh, they made quite a few of these. And you're likely to find them if you're out and uh, searching for pieces in antique shops and going to auctions. Sometimes the auctioneers put these in box lots too. Sometimes they go for thirty dollars. They're worth much more than that. Here's the bottom of it. You can see the little spurs, the spur marks from where they rested during the firing, so the base could be completely glazed. And Tung Shi, you find a lot of things with spur marks in the Tung Shi period. Here's another one, a melon jar, quite well outlined. Uh, the details are good. The fruit have a, a nice color and tone to them, and well executed. The little stem, you see the stem handle on top. It's like a stem coming out of a melon. And there's the bottom of this. Again, more spur marks patterned around the foot. Uh, the base is slightly concave with the uh, Tung Shi mark in the center. And uh, very typical. And uh, this is a four character mark. I think we're going to blow this up a little bit. Get a better look at the mark. There it is. This is a four character Tung Shi mark. Alright, it's missing the first two. Uh, they did them often this way, and those seals were applied uh, with these sort of rubber seals that they managed to make that they carved when they, when they marked them. And uh, this is the last item we're going to look at, a pair of cranes. And uh, these are, it's funny, these are the Femi Noir, they're Femi Ver, but they're uh, nicely done, late 19th century. And uh, here are the bottoms, a big hole in the bottom, and the, they're hollowed out all the way up inside. But pretty neatly done, nicely, nicely, very nicely painted, nicely potted. And these were quite tall. I think they were over 20 inches tall. And that's it. And I hope some of this you found useful. If I went too fast, go back and uh, uh, go through it again if you can stand listening to me. <laughs> but I do appreciate you taking the time to visit. And if you have any questions about anything you own or uh, w want to ask something of us, please feel free to do so. You can get our contact information at bidamount.com in the Contact Us area. And uh, we answer all emails pretty quickly. And uh, ha have a great day, and thanks so much for uh, stopping by. Thank you.